We're going to focus this afternoon um, on therapy. Um, I want to acknowledge also um, our co-sponsor for this program and really our partner uh, in the National MS Society, New York City, Southern New York chapter. We work very closely with the National MS Society um, in many ways. We're very proud that the center was, was uh, among the very first uh, centers certified by the National MS Society as a comprehensive care center. You, you, thank you. You probably know that next to the, next to the NIH, the National MS Society is, is the um, major funder of MS research in the United States and indeed around, around the world. But also, uh, they are very instrumental in providing funds to train the future workforce uh, in MS. People like Dr. Loveland and I um, are, have too many gray hairs. We need younger people taking care of, uh, of patients with MS. And you've already met uh, two of our uh, former trainees, Dr. Fabian and Dr. Krieger, both of whom received Sylvia Lowry clinical trials fellowships from the National MS Society. And without the, um, with the, without the financial support of the society, we would not be able to train future uh, people to take care of patients with MS. The next speaker, um, Dr. Alana Katzin, is our current senior fellow uh, in, uh, at the center. <clears throat> and like Dr. Krieger and Dr. Fabian, she too is the recipient of a Sylvia, Sylvia Lowry Clinical Fellowship. Dr. Katz uh, did her medical school training at Columbia University and then stayed on there uh, to complete her neurology residency before coming to us in July of uh, uh, 2011. Um, and Dr. Katz is going to talk to you about current therapy in MS. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Please continue eating your lunch. So we're going to talk for a bit now about current therapies for MS. So we'll start by going over what are the different types of MS treatments. So the first type of treatment is treatment of relapses or attacks that you heard about this morning. The second, which is going to be the focus of our talk today, is disease-modifying or long-term treatments for MS. And then the last type of MS treatment is symptomatic treatments, which you're going to hear about more later this afternoon. So first, treatment of relapses. So the standby for treatment of relapses, as I'm sure many of you know, is treatment with steroids. And we usually give steroids through an IV. The formulation we usually use is called methylprednisolone, or solumedrol. And we usually give that daily for three to five days. And the hope and the reason we use the steroids is that we want to help speed recovery of whatever that deficit is that the patient is experiencing. Sometimes we'll follow that with oral steroids by mouth, um, but sometimes not, and that depends on the individual patient. We don't use steroids by mouth alone because there is some data that suggests that it actually might be harmful or at least not as helpful as the IV formulation. If recovery from that attack is not quite optimal and there's still impaired functions, such as problems with vision or problems with walking, things that are really giving someone a hard time, then sometimes we'll consider giving more steroids, doing another course. And if that doesn't help and there's really a problem, then sometimes we'll use something called plasmapheresis, which is when you get hooked up to a machine, it's almost like dialysis, and the blood gets kind of cleaned out to get some of those harmful inflammatory factors and antibodies out of the blood. And sometimes that can be very helpful as well. So that's what we do for relapses. So on to the disease-modifying or long-term type of treatments. So the question that we always get from patients when they're first diagnosed is, why do I need to go on one of these treatments? And what are we hoping that these treatments are going to, what are we hoping that they're going to do? So our first goal is to prevent relapses. <clears throat> 
So as I'm sure many of you know, with every relapse that you have, we hope that the patient gets better with steroids and gets better with time, but sometimes recovery is not quite complete. And so then the patient can be left with some amount of disability, some disturbance in their daily life. And so if we can prevent relapses, then we want to do that. Ultimately, we want to prevent long-term disability. And we try to do that through preventing relapses. We also hope that if we treat patients when they're in the relapsing remitting phase of the disease, when there's this inflammatory component, that that will end up helping us later on in terms of developing progressive disease, although we don't really have long-term data on a lot of our drugs to support that, but that's definitely one of our goals. Something that I'm sure a lot of people hear about in their appointments is the MRI, and you heard a lot about that this morning already. But we want to prevent people from having new lesions on MRI because that helps us gauge what the disease activity is. So we want to make sure there's not a lot of new lesions, those discrete lesions that you saw with Dr. Fabian this morning. We want to make sure those are not developing. And we hope that by decreasing this new lesion formation, that we can also prevent people from having that atrophy that you heard about a little bit with Dr. DeLuca um, that can be correlated a bit to cognitive problems and just overall problems with functioning. So that's why we want to put people on these medications. Basically, we know from studies that patients who are on medications do better over the long term than patients who are not on medications. So who should be on a disease-modifying treatment for MS? So all of our currently approved therapies for MS, the ones that we're going to talk about in this discussion at least, are for relapsing forms of MS. And so that means patients who have relapses, so people who are still having those attacks that we've been talking about, and for people who have new lesions on MRI. So there are some cases where people have progressive disease, but we may still use one of these inflammatory treatments um, because there are new lesions developing on the MRI. We will sometimes put patients who don't have a full diagnosis of MS uh, on one of these treatments. And that's when we suspect that someone really does have MS, but it's just too early to make a diagnosis. And that's a conversation we have frequently, because we know that when MS is treated at the early stages, people do better. And so we want to get people on treatment as early as possible. And so even if a patient has a diagnosis of what we call the clinically isolated syndrome, or CIS, which just means they've only had one attack, and so they don't meet the criteria that Dr. Fabian talked about, we may still put them on disease-modifying medicine for MS, especially if they have those characteristic changes on MRI. So what are the disease-modifying treatments that are approved to treat MS? We're going to go through each one of these in a bit more detail. So first, the interferons. Then we'll talk about Copaxone. We'll talk about Tysabri, we'll talk about Jelenia, and we'll talk about Albagio. And those are in the order in which those have been introduced to the market. So the next question is going to be, after I've just shown you this big list of medications, how do we make a treatment decision in the individual patient? And that is a very difficult decision that uh, has a lot of factors that we have to consider. And that is that occurs after a discussion with the healthcare provider about what are the benefits of certain medications, what are the risks, what, is that, what are that individual patient's preferences, what is your particular lifestyle, uh, family planning issues. There are a lot of things that go into that decision. So this is an even more complicated slide than Dr. Fabian showed you this morning. But what I want you to take away from this slide is that the immune system is very, very complicated, and MS is a very complicated disease. And we actually still don't understand a lot of why MS occurs and, and what we can do about it. But the things I want you to take away from this slide are, the bottom part of the slide is the bloodstream. And you can see there that there's a lot of activity going on there. So this is showing you some of the immune cells. So we're gonna talk a little bit about lymphocytes, that type of white blood cell, in particular the T cells that Dr. Fabian had mentioned this morning. And then you see that dividing line there with something that's labeled BBB, and that's for blood-brain barrier. 
And that's the barrier between the blood and the brain, or the spinal cord, the central nervous system. And then there's what happens inside the nervous system. And so the different drugs that we have for MS will act on different parts of this. But basically the idea is that there's this inflammation that happens, that we see that there's abnormal inflammation in the bloodstream, there's something that happens when those immune cells get into, across that blood-brain barrier into the central nervous system, and then there's activity that happens there. So those are all potential areas that we can try and target with our medications. So we'll start with interferons. So the question is, how do they work? And that's actually a really good question, because even though we have had interferons for a very long time, we still don't really completely understand how they work for MS. We know that they work, but we don't know exactly how. <clears throat> we know the mechanism is probably uh, very complicated, and there are a lot of different areas that actually have, have been figured out. We know that interferons affect gene products that can influence the immune system. So like Dr. Casaccio was talking about, you have your genes, but then the way those genes work uh, to produce proteins and things in your, in your body can be modified by your lifestyle, but also by medications. And so we know that that's one of the ways that interferons work. They also have effects at the blood-brain barrier we were talking about and inside the nervous system as well. So how effective are these drugs and how are they given? So interferons are modestly effective drugs. We know that high-dose interferons reduce the relapse rate by somewhere in the range of 30 to 35 percent. So we talk about interferon beta 1A and 1B. So 1A can be given as Rebif, which is given three times per week as an injection just under the skin, subcutaneous, or Avonex. And Avonex is given once per week into the muscle. And then there's interferon beta 1B, which is available as beta seron or Xtavia, and those are given every other day just under the skin or subcutaneous. Basically, we consider all of these formulations except Avonex to be high-dose interferon because the dosing is more frequent, you get a higher dose, whereas Avonex is a, a lower-dose interferon. And of course, it's nice uh, for Avonex that it's only once a week, but it is a little bit of a lower dose of the drug overall. So what are the side effects and what kind of monitoring needs to be done if you're on one of these medications? So the biggest problem we tend to have with interferons when we first start a patient on them is that they can cause flu-like side effects. So low-grade fevers, chills, muscle aches, headache, just a, a general feeling of, of not feeling so well. And it certainly doesn't happen to everybody. And for most people, it actually improves. And after about a month or two of being on the medication, it evens out and it often goes away completely, uh, which is great. A lot of patients also can have some relief with Tylenol, Advil, things like that. Rarely it's a persistent problem and we end up having to change the medication because it really is a problem, but that's actually pretty rare. It can cause some mood changes. So we have some patients who feel down while taking interferons or who feel irritable. With any injection medication, there are issues of injection site reactions, which basically means you're putting a medication just under the skin into that tissue there, and there can be some local inflammation there. So there can be some redness around the site, which can sometimes hurt a bit or can cause bruising. So the injections can sometimes be a bit difficult. But usually, as a patient's on the drug for a longer period of time and they get kind of used to doing these injections and they improve their technique, working with our nurses, that usually gets better over time. Rarely, there can be some issues with the liver or the blood counts, and so when you're taking these drugs, you have to have blood tests every few months. And the last issue is that sometimes after you're on one of these drugs for a period of time, your body can actually start recognizing that medication as foreign and make antibodies against the medicine. And that can reduce the effectiveness of the medicine over time. And so sometimes if we see someone who's done very well on interferon for a long time and then suddenly they're not doing as well, that can be a reason why. <clears throat> so our next medication is Copaxone or Glitirimer. So Copaxone is also a drug that we've had for a very long time, but also a drug that we still don't quite understand how it works. 
We do know that it has very important effects on the balance of the immune system, particularly on those T lymphocytes that we were talking about earlier. It's also a modestly effective drug, also reduces the relapse rate by somewhere in the range of 30 to 35 percent. And there was actually one trial that compared Copaxone to high-dose interferons and found no major differences. And Copaxone is also given as a daily subcutaneous, just under the skin, injection. So side effects and monitoring for Copaxone. So again, those injection site reactions can be a problem. For Copaxone, it can be a little bit more of a problem because it's a daily injection as opposed to those three times a week injections. <clears throat> there is also something called an immediate post-injection reaction that can happen. It doesn't happen very often. It's supposed to be somewhere in the range of one in a few thousand injections, although some people have it more frequently and some people seem to not have it at all. But we always tell patients about it because it's not dangerous, but it can be something scary if it happens to you. And what it is is we think it's probably when the medicine by accident goes into a little vein and gets sort of systemically absorbed all at once, but it can cause a few minutes of palpitation, shortness of breath, feeling of nausea or anxiety, just not feeling so good. But it passes after a few minutes, and like I had said, it's not dangerous. It's just something to be aware of in case it happens. One of the issues we tend to have with Copaxone over time is that there can be some issues with cosmetic changes to the skin. So it can cause something called lipoatrophy, which just means loss of fat cells. And so after doing these injections over years, sometimes we'll start to see that loss of fat cells in areas where there's been repeated injections. And so that can cause some dimpling in the skin. Usually the injections are done in hidden sites, and so it's not too much of a problem, um, but sometimes it gets to be a real problem and it ends up being a reason that we have to take a patient off, off of a drug. The nice thing in terms of comparing it to interferon is that you don't need to have the blood tests and it doesn't cause any of those flu-like symptoms so there's not that to deal with or the mood issues, but it is a daily injection. <clears throat> and so people are usually weighing, in terms of their preferences, what they might rather experience. So our next drug is Tysabri, or natalizumab. So Tysabri, we actually have a little bit better understanding of how it works. We know that it affects the trafficking of lymphocytes and that it keeps those immune, system, those immune cells from getting into the brain. So it works at, you can see that line right down the middle where there's the blood-brain barrier. And so it keeps those immune cells from getting into the brain and the spinal cord and causing all of that inflammation. <clears throat> so Tysabri is a highly effective drug. In its clinical trial, it reduced relapse rate by 68%. It's given by infusion which means through an IV at an infusion center. It takes about an hour for the infusion and about an hour you have to stay afterwards for monitoring. We'll go over why that is. So it takes about a half a day, we usually tell people, and you need to have a dose once every four weeks. So you can figure on a half day out of your regular activities per month. Although the nice thing is that then in between that, there's no injections or other things that you need to do. So in terms of the side effects and monitoring for Tysabri, so Tysabri is associated with a rare but very serious brain infection called PML, and we're gonna spend some more time going over that. There's a small incidence of allergic reactions with Tysabri. If that happens, it usually happens on the second infusion, although it can happen later. And if you have an allergic reaction, then the drug does have to be stopped. You also do need those blood tests like you did with the interferons, so once every few months. And those can be done either at infusions or at appointments or things like that. But very rarely do we find problems with those. So the main side effect <clears throat> that we have issues with, and that I'm sure a lot of you have heard about, it's been in the news and things like that, is PML. So PML stands for Progressive Multifocal Leukoencephalopathy. And it is a rare but very serious brain infection. We now know a lot more about PML than we did before. Um, previously, PML was really only seen in late-stage AIDS patients who had very, very poor immune systems. 
So we now know that PML is caused by the JC virus. So what is the JC virus? It's probably not a virus you've heard of. We actually don't really know what the JC virus does. We don't know if it's a cold or how you get it or what it is. It's probably something benign because when we do tests, we find that half the population shows that they've been exposed to it at some point in their life. So half the population has been exposed to this virus and has antibody to it. So how does PML present? So patients will typically come in with mental status changes, and that's accompanied by weakness or difficulty walking or visual problems. And at the surface, that sounds a lot like some of the problems that people can have with MS. And so there, I think there's a lot of con appropriate concern about being able to tell if an MS patient develops PML. Um, but I think the symptoms are different enough and the appearance on MRI is different enough that an MS specialist can, can tell the difference between these things. So how do we know who's going to get PML? How can we predict who uh, is a good patient for Tysabri and who's not? So we now know that the chances of getting PML are increased by, one, having a positive JC virus antibody, which indicates that you've been exposed to that at some point in the past. Two, having been treated previously with chemotherapy or immune suppressant drugs. That does not include the other MS medications, since those are actually not immune suppressants. Those are immune modulators. But we're talking about sort of heavy duty uh, immune suppressants. So drugs that are used for other anti-inflammatory conditions or cancers. And then the third risk factor is a long duration on Tysabri in a patient who is positive for the antibody. So what is the risk of getting PML? So this is something patients always want to know. They say, you know, tell me the numbers. What are my chances of getting this if I go on this disease? And so this is a nice chart here that actually breaks it up by the different risk factors. So you can see along the side, uh, JC virus antibody negative or JC virus antibody positive. And so you can, as you look across, you can see that if you are negative for the JC virus antibody, your risk of getting PML is extremely, extremely small, even if you've had prior chemotherapy. And most of this is actually based on hypothetical situations since we've had a very, very few cases of patients who are negative getting PML. If you are positive for the antibody, this is further stratified by who has or has not had prior chemotherapy. And so the important things to look at here are what is the risk uh, in the first two years on therapy, and what is the risk thereafter? And you can see that the risk starts to go up after two years on therapy. And so, for a patient who is positive for the JC virus antibody, who has had prior chemotherapy, that's probably not a patient where Tysabri is going to be our best choice. But there are certainly patients who are positive for the JC virus antibody who don't have the other risk factors. And because of some of those individualized reasons that we talked about at the beginning, we may still decide that Tysabri is the, is the best treatment for them at that time. So what do we do if PML happens? So the steps that, that would be taken would be, first of all, to stop the Tysabri. Second of all, we can use that plasma exchange process that we talked about a little bit for relapses. A similar process can actually be used to take out any Tysabri that's left in the bloodstream. If there's a lot of inflammation, sometimes steroids can be used. Unfortunately, there's no specific antiviral treatment for PML. And I think part of that is because, in general, we're not good at treating viruses, um, but especially because this is not a virus that got a lot of attention before this whole thing happened. So in terms of outcomes, approximately 20% of patients with PML get completely better, about 20% actually die from the disease, and the remaining 60% have some residual disability. So the take home from this is that Tysabri is a very highly effective drug for MS, but there are some risks to it. And we now have a lot more information about the risk of PML, and we're able to, on an individual basis, calculate the risk such that we can minimize it and make it so that we can use this drug safely. So our next treatment is Jelenia. So how does Jelenia work? Jelenia is one of our newer drugs. 
So you can see from the top part of the diagram here, um, this is a lymph node. Everyone has these lymph nodes throughout their body. You may notice when you get sick, for example, the lymph nodes in your neck may get bigger, and that's because there's a lot of activity going on there to try and fight an infection, for example. And so these lymphocytes, uh, at some point in their life cycle, at the beginning especially, are inside this lymph node. And to get out of the lymph node, to go into the bloodstream, and eventually to get into the brain to cause problems like they do in MS, they need this receptor called the S1P1 receptor. And so Jelenia comes in and down-regulates that S1P1 receptor such that those lymphocytes, those immune cells, actually get stuck inside the lymph node and can't get out. So if they can't get out, they can't get into the bloodstream, which means they can't get into the brain. And so it basically keeps those lymphocytes inside the lymph nodes. So Jelenia, we sort of rate as a moderate to highly effective drug. It reduced the relapse rate by about 55% in its clinical trial. The really exciting thing about Jelenia, compared to all these other drugs, is that it's our first pill. And it just has to be taken once a day. So in terms of side effects and monitoring for Jelenia. So there's a few issues uh, that we have with Jelenia that need to be dealt with. And part of this is increased vigilance on our part because it's still a new drug. It's been out on the market for about two years. And we do have some experience with it now, but not, of course, as much experience as we have with things like the interferons and copaxone, which we know for a long time are very safe drugs. So one of the things that can happen with Jelenia is something called macular edema. Macular edema is just a swelling that can happen in the eye. And it can, if it goes unrecognized, it can impair vision and cause a lot of problems. So obviously, we don't want that to happen to our patients. So before you start on Jelenia, you have to see an eye doctor to make sure the eyes are OK. And then you need to have a follow-up at three months after starting the drug, at six months, and then it goes to yearly. Because if macular edema is going to happen, it usually happens early on. Uh, what's, what's a great thing about this is that if you do those eye visits as you're supposed to, in most cases, the eye doctor will pick it up before there are any problems with the vision. And it's reversible when the drug is stopped. So if it's caught early, it shouldn't be a problem. There's a question in the clinical trials about whether there's an increased risk of skin cancers with Jelenia. It's something we're not entirely sure about. Um, but to be on the safe side, we have people do visit to a dermatologist. So they go to see a dermatologist before starting the drug, and then they keep going for skin checks, which really is something that's recommended for the general population anyway. But if someone's going to go on Jelenia, that's something that will require. So the next thing to address is the status of the varicella virus. The varicella virus is the chickenpox virus. So most people had chickenpox as a child, um, but there's always a few who never had it for whatever reason. And nowadays, many people are actually vaccinated. All the kids now are vaccinated and are not getting chickenpox. But there are still a few adults out there who never had chickenpox and didn't get the vaccine. And so that's something that the doctor will ask you about. And if you didn't have chickenpox, then we would recommend that you get the vaccine before starting on Jelenia. And that's because there is some question about whether it could cause major problems in a primary infection. And there was one patient in the clinical trial who actually died from a disseminated infection. Um, as I'm sure some of you know, getting chickenpox as an adult is very different from getting it as a child. <clears throat> there are some cardiac issues that go along with Jelenia. So before starting it, there has to be a discussion with the doctor in terms of cardiac health. Um, if there are any cardiac problems, and uh, especially it's very important to tell the doctor about any medications that you're taking. That's always important, but especially for this drug, including blood pressure medicines. All patients have to go for an EKG, which is that heart rhythm test where they put the little stickers on you. It just takes a few minutes, and it can be done by your primary doctor, uh, but just to make sure that there's no unrecognized problems with the heart before starting this drug. We also know that the drug causes a decrease in the heart rate, 
Um, that's something that's only an issue when the drug is first started. And so the first dose has to be given in a doctor's office. And you have to stay there for six hours for monitoring for them to check your heart rating or blood pressure. Um, but then all subsequent doses can be taken at home. You also need blood tests every few months, similar to the way you do with some of the other drugs, to check the blood counts on the liver. So our last drug is also very exciting, Arbagio. Um, and it's exciting because it's only been out for a month now. So how does it work? It is the active metabolite of leflunamide, which is a drug that's been used in this country, marketed as Areva, some of you may have heard of it, for rheumatoid arthritis. And that's been on the market for some time in the US. There's probably also a lot of different mechanisms for this drug, but we do know a little bit about the way that we think it works. And it inhibits an enzyme that allows it to selectively work on these overactive immune cells, the overactive lymphocytes, without working on your regular lymphocytes. So it, it doesn't impair your, your normal lymphocytes that are trying to fight infections and things like that. It only works on those ones that are too active and trying to get into the brain and cause trouble. So we classify this as another modestly effective drug that reduced relapse rates in the range of 30 to 35 percent in clinical trials. There was one trial that we don't have the full information yet, but uh, it was compared to high-dose interferon, and it showed no major differences. It's also a once-daily pill, which is very exciting. In terms of side effects and monitoring, so there's a small incidence of GI upset, so it can cause some nausea or diarrhea, things like that. Doesn't happen that commonly. And there's a small incidence of hair thinning, which is something that when people first hear, they tend to get upset about the idea of losing hair. Um, but all it is is a small acceleration of the normal hair loss process. It actually usually gets better even if you continue the drug um, over the course of a few months, but certainly is reversible when the drug is stopped if it's really a major problem. Uh, if you need to have blood tests, similar to some of the other drugs, uh, for blood counts and liver. And for the first few months, you actually need to have a monthly liver test just to make sure that's OK. The only other thing you need before starting it is a PPD, which is that skin test for tuberculosis before starting the drug. OK. So just to sum up, we now have many, many treatment options available for relapsing MS. And you're going to hear shortly about some of the ones that we have coming. The older treatments tend to be moderately effective, um, and they're very, very safe, but they do require injections. Whereas the newer treatments, some of them are a little bit more effective, but some of those have some safety concerns that we talked about. And treatment decision for each patient is based on a often long conversation with your healthcare provider, considering all of the individual factors that go into making these decisions. And certainly, these are decisions that can change over time. I think we're good. So, thank you all for your attention for coming today. So, as you can see, we've made a lot of, a lot of progress in our ability to treat MS, and I'll have the opportunity later on to talk about some of the newer treatments.